director of gradual climate protection, one of the sponsors of this event. And uh, I want to thank our co-sponsors, Broward Energy Committee, the Marlboro College Graduate School, Broward Food Co-op, and Sovereign Solar. Uh, also, a special thanks to my co-organizer, Dave Cohen. Are there any dealers or businesses who would like to introduce themselves before we get started? I'll introduce myself. So, hi folks, I'm John Gilbrook. I'm with ChargePoint. ChargePoint is the largest electric vehicle charging station uh, network, so uh, EV charging network in the world. Uh, we have 19,000 stations deployed uh, nationally. So I think, I'm not sure if we have one here in Brattleboro, we have others in Vermont, all throughout New England. So uh, we sell stations to businesses that want to offer EV charging to the public. Hi, I'm Peter Thurl. I own Sovereign Solar. Um, we're the folks who have to find a way to get the electricity to fire up your electric vehicles. And we sell um, community solar projects where people who don't have a location to put solar in their own business or home can buy panels in one of our solar farms and get the credit from them just as if it was on their own home. So if you want to go electric and go solar, you can. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention that we do have a new electric vehicle charging station here in Brownboro. It's in the transportation center on Platt Street on the first level. It's a level two charger which charges up an average vehicle on three to four hours. And there's uh, two stations there that are free and open to the public. Um, so be sure to, um, to use those and, and, and tell your friends about them. So what we're going to do now is have two presentations. And the second one on electric bicycles. And uh, I'd like to ask everyone to, unless you have a clarifying question, to just hold your questions until the end of the hour, and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for a discussion. We have Tabori Rule here this, uh, as our first speaker. Uh, Tabori lives in New Haven, Vermont, with his wife, three children, and two dogs, and an off grid house powered by solar and wind. Roy is a former Marine Corps officer and holds a bachelor's degree in history and journalism from Texas a and University and a master's degree in history from California State University. He currently teaches history, economics, and government at the high school level as the board of directors for the Acorn Renewable Energy Co-op in Addison County. So, thank you. Good morning. Hey, everybody. Good morning. I think I can talk loud because I talk about computers all day. Um, if you can't quite hear me, there's, there's some more room here. So I apologize to Paul, this is actually my slide from a year ago when I did this in Addison County. Uh, my, my friend told me the other week, um, actually before I gave one of these other ones, he said, try to give them an unbiased opinion. And I said, well, that's going to be kind of hard because I really, really like my car. Um, so I will do my best to give you an unbiased opinion. Keep in mind that I really, really like my car. I'll tell you just a little bit about it in a second. So um, I can talk. This, this is kind of set up to be 45 minutes or an hour, and I have 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk relatively quickly. Uh, it will seem probably that I'm glossing over some things. I'll be here afterwards. Feel free to come up to me, um, and I can answer some more questions in depth. Uh, I think if Paul wants the whole questions to the end, uh, you might even jot them down, um, and then uh, after Dave talks, I can answer your questions. So um, this presentation is kind of geared towards the basics of EV. Not so much the, the advanced stuff. Um, I can answer a lot of those questions if you'd like. Um, but this is pretty much for people that might have only never driven an EV or just seen one for the first time today. So I'm talking to you. Um, and uh, if uh, you know more about them and have some more specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I happen to know. But in, over the last couple of years, I've, I've uh, managed to learn a, a fair amount about EVs. So um, I want to talk about basics of EVs, how I ended up with the lead. Uh, some popular models, how they charge, how they pay off, um, some, some, uh, something about the environmental debate uh, around EVs, and uh, a little bit about future EV trends. So again, I have to go relatively quickly. Here is my basic slide. Here, here's your EV basic right here. Um, this little, this little I, just, I just found this when I looked for it. I it on slides online. Uh, this is actually a remarkably accurate little picture. Uh, for a Nissan Leaf, we have a battery, an electric motor, a seven to one reduction, and drive to the wheels. That's pretty much all there is. Um, not too many moving parts. Uh, the electric cars you see out front that are all electric are essentially like this. Uh, so, 
terminology confuses people when we start talking about these things. Ten years ago, the car manufacturers developed hybrids. They added a, they added a battery to cars to make the to make the gasoline engine run more efficiently. Um, then hobbyists in the last decade started wanting to charge that battery with wall power, and they started, particularly with the Toyota Prius hybrid, um, doing homemade modifications to plug those things into the wall. Um, they realized that when they did this, they could drive around town on just the battery. Uh, the car, they asked Toyota repeatedly, um, and Toyota finally listened and made a plug-in Prius. Um, and so a plug-in hybrid still has a gasoline engine, uh, but you can plug it in the wall to help plug the battery, to help charge the battery. So we'll talk about that. Um, some, some cars are variations of that, like the Chevy Bolt. The Chevy Bolt has a gasoline engine, but the gasoline engine does not directly power the wheels. The gasoline engine only powers the generator, which then powers the wheels. So in some ways, a Chevy Bolt is a, is a cross between, say, a Toyota hybrid uh, or, or a Prius um, uh, and a Nissan Leaf. That we'll talk about in a second. And then there are all electric vehicles. So I have a Nissan Leaf. It has no engine, um, just batteries. Um, and so these are sometimes called all electric vehicles or battery electric vehicles. Uh, you'll see different. Uh, so as to which one you should choose, it's complicated. Um, I wanted to be a purist. I decided that uh, for a little risk, living on the edge, I would just go all electric. Um, so far, I've had my cars almost two years. Uh, love them a lot. I, I think it's been a good decision for me. Different people have different comfort levels with living on the edge. Uh, different people have different driving requirements, financial requirements. Um, it depends on whether or not you're buying this vehicle as a second car, whether you have a backup. And I'll try to touch on some of those topics in just a little bit. Um, we'll talk about them as a group, and then uh, if you need more information about maybe to help you decide which one you might want to look at, um, we can do that in a little bit. So what's it like to drive an EV? They are really fantastic cars. Um, they are quite speedy. Uh, electric motors deliver all their torque and all RPMs. So when you press on the accelerator at two miles an hour, uh, you get home. I, I told someone the other day, uh, I told some of you standing out front here, um, it's a little bit motorcycle-like. Uh, if you've ridden a motorcycle, the acceleration. It's the one thing I did not expect when I bought an electric vehicle. Electric vehicle for all these other reasons. Uh, I didn't realize it was such a zippy little car. Uh, they're quite fun to drive. Uh, nice acceleration. They also have no transmissions, so the cars accelerate from zero miles an hour to, I've had mine up to 87. They say to go 92 before the computer cuts it back. Um, but this acceleration is extremely smooth. There's no transmission. It's uh, constant and instant acceleration at any time. Uh, I can be going up a mountain at 65 miles an hour and, and floor it and jump up to 85 miles an hour just like that. Um, so quite zippy. The, the cars are designed that when you put on the brakes, it actually uses your forward momentum to recharge the battery. So it's called regenerative braking. Um, it is quite a nifty experience to come down a big mountain and watch your gas gauge fill up. Uh, because that's, that's what happens if you're coming down, say, from Killington back down into Rutland. So uh, pretty nifty. Um, the range, tell you what, let me talk about range when we get to individual types. Um, it varies. Uh, some of the hybrids go 8 to 10 miles on just a battery. Um, well, let's talk about it, I guess. <laughs> the Volt would go roughly 40 miles on just a battery before the gasoline engine kicks in. Um, my Nissan Leaf will go, depending on the weather, uh, between 80 and 100 miles on a charge. Uh, and if you have a Tesla, depending on the battery pack, you can go 280 miles on a charge. So, if you have $90,000, the Tesla is definitely the car. <laughs> uh, uh, so the cars are cheap to operate. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, virtually no maintenance on an electric car. Um, and again, I'm not so sure about a, a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid, um, but an all-electric car, there are just very few moving parts. Um, I used to be a mechanic in my former life, um, uh, worked on BMWs, but com compared to a internal combustion engine, battery power car, almost no moving parts. There's one reduction gear, uh, so you have the, the moving armature in the motor, one reduction gear, and it goes straight out the axle shafts to the wheels, um, and that's it. Uh, so compared to the thousands of parts in the typical engine and transmission, uh, make them quite reliable. Because the, because the motor regenerates power when you brake, you actually don't use the brake pads very much. Um, the, 
unless you're braking very hard or very low speeds, I doubt the pads really even touch the rotor. Um, you put on the brakes and it pulls power back through the motor to charge the battery and slows you right down without having to use them. It's still a brake pedal, but it's not using the brake pads very much. Um, and the, the big reason uh, to get one, I think, is that it's just better for the planet. The cars are more efficient. Um, they're virtually the only transportation medium that can be powered with renewable energy. And we'll talk about that again in a second, too. Um, so here's a picture under the hood of my Leaf. Uh, one of the Leafs, there's an inverter right here. Uh, underneath that is an electric motor. I think it's rated at a little over 100 horsepower. Uh, it's probably this big right now. So uh, the batteries are in the floor of the car. They're the, the heaviest portion of the, of the car, or a good chunk of the weight of the car is the batteries. So the cars on the whole are slightly heavier um, than a typical gas power car of that size. So here's me buying one of my Leafs um, on the very back from Plattsburgh, New York. I had to make sure I didn't wear that shirt today. Um, <laughs> so here's, here's how it happened for me. We live in New Haven. Um, I'm concerned about the environment and have been for, for decades and getting more concerned all the time. Um, we have an off-grid house, we have solar and wind. Uh, we grow a lot of our own vegetables. Uh, we buy organic. Uh, we heat with wood, sustainably harvested off our property. Um, and then about a year and a half or two years ago, I started writing a blog about environmental issues. I started paying even more attention to these things. It just becomes more and more apparent to me that in the long view, uh, we, are, we are trashing the planet at a pretty rapid rate. Um, so I started talking about that um, on the blog. Um, we bought an electric lawnmower, which is pretty cool. Uh, like it a lot, works great. And then I realized that, oops. For all my efforts, I'm still not substantially reducing my carbon footprint. Because if you have an off-grid house, suddenly the vast majority of your carbon use is your vehicle transportation. Um, and so that's when I started looking at electric cars. Um, and I went over to, to Plattsburgh, uh, to Garen's Nissan, and I bought the first Leaf. And before I did it, I did a little cost calculation. This is my very rusty Subaru. My wife was shocked at this picture. She said, your car doesn't look that good. Um, uh, flipping it along, and I tried to do an apples to apples comparison with the cost of this beater Subaru with the cost of the Leaf. Um, my gut told me that it would be about the same, um, and so I won't go through all the numbers, but I figured that everything I could think of, even the beater was costing me over $300 a month to, to run and repair and replace. Um, so here's the same numbers, apples to apples, the best I could do with the Nissan Leafs. So, me something. The, the, the bottom line here, literally the bottom line, uh, the big difference is it cost me about $50 more a month to drive a brand new electric car um, than it did to drive my rusty Peter Subaru. Um, in fact, I was so excited and convinced when I realized that this was actually true that I went and bought a second one. Um, so my wife has a Leaf and I have a Leaf. Um, she actually lives, she actually works quite close to where we live um, and has a charger at her work. So. We rotate cars every day. So I drive 100 miles a day, she drives five. Um, so she fills up the car and we switch every day, which confuses my students. They're not actually sure what color my car is. <laughs> so in the summer, I can just plug into my bar, plug into our power system, and charge your car. Um, in the winter, when the days are short, um, I can't do that. I'm currently doing a solar expansion. Um, but but it, it is a pretty nifty feeling to realize that you are propelling yourself down the road on sunshine. Um, uh, a whole bunch of the public chargers in Burlington, so I'm from up north, a whole bunch of the public chargers in Burlington are also uh, a net meter to solar panels. Um, and so you're literally using solar power uh, to bring out your body around. So some common vehicles, uh, there are here a couple, couple different things here. First, the number of EVs on the road is doubling every year since 20, the end of 2010. Um, so it's like an exponential growth. Of EVs. Um, the same is true in Vermont. They expect this doubling to continue until 2017, and some thinkers think until 2020. Um, so there will soon be dramatically, dramatically more electric vehicles on the road. And once you drive one, you'll have one too, and you'll be part of this. Uh, they're, they're pretty nifty cars. Um, there's this misconception that they're too expensive. Only rich, only rich left-winging liberals drive, drive a Leaf. 
Um, not true. Uh, they're they're not substantially, particularly if you lease, um, if, you, if you factor out the gas, um, not substantially more expensive than uh, other forms of transportation. So same as group one. So the big four. Still, the biggest four production vehicles uh, that are electric or hybrid electric, plug-in hybrids, are the Chevy Volt. There's a couple outside, a couple of Volt owners in here. Um, Volt owners have the highest customer satisfaction. I think of in cars of the Tesla. So again, if you have ninety thousand dollars, the Tesla is the car for you. Um, but Volt owners are very happy with their cars. It has a gasoline engine with a battery backup. The battery can take it about. Um, sales wise, neck and neck with the Leaf. Who's selling the most? Almost varies month by month. Um, so uh, the Nissan Leaf, all batteries, goes about 100 miles on the charge. Um, number three, by most accounts, uh, is the Tesla. So the Tesla Model S has won more car awards, I think, than any car in history. Um, it is an absolutely amazing car. Uh, he wrote a 60 and something like 4.6 seconds. The new ones are 4.3. So that's like motorcycle fast right there. Um, so. Amazing car. I put one more slide in here. This is the Roadster. Uh, this is the car Tesla started with. You can't buy this anymore. Um, they made some of these to, to test out their production model, and then they switched to the Model S. Um, so please come in. Um, this is a plug-in Prius, uh, probably the fourth of the big four common ones. Um, the plug-in Prius is both batteries and a motor. Uh, the batteries that take you, different people get mad at me when they're People have, I've heard different things, between 8 and 15 miles on just battery, um, and then the engine kicks in, um, you can drive it at the end. Um, but people love their Priuses as well. And then there's Keith. There's Keith. That's not actually Keith, but he has one just like that. Um, and since I made this presentation just a year ago, uh, there are dramatically more production vehicles. Ford was here today um, with their offerings. Uh, there are 19 or 20 or 22 different factory-made models of one form or variation of this or the other um, right now. And more every day, more every day. They're, they're very, very much moving. Really, you can also get motorcycles, scooters, bikes. Dave's going to talk about bikes um, when I'm done here in 12 minutes. So, I have to talk so. so how do you get that power in the car? So again, some of you know this if you drive one. But if you don't, here's the deal. Um, level one charging, the connection to the car usually looks like this. Um, this is the, the most standard connector. You just plug it in the car. And on the other end, it looks like this. Um, not quite like this. This is probably a lamp cord. But you can plug it into a wall outlet, just like that wall outlet back there. A um, slightly heavier cord. Um, and if you do that, you can charge my car, typically, depends on how empty it is, typically 12 hours, 12 to 15 hours overnight, um, just with the wall outlet. Now, if you want a little faster, you can move up to level two charging. So the connection to the car is the same, the same connector, um, but it's a 220 feed, so it charges dramatically quicker, between three and four hours typically. Um, uh, it can be wall mounted like this. Uh, so this is one probably not in public. Uh, at a Nissan dealership, it can be in your garage or outside at your home or your place of work. Uh, and then charge point is here. So a lot of the public charging stations look like this. This is actually an old picture. All the new ones have two chargers. You can see an actual model in the room next door. Um, so uh, the public the public chargers, most of them are subsidized either by the utility companies or by the towns. Almost all of them are free. You do have to have a charger. tell you if you're in an emergency and you call the number on charge point cards, if you call the number right here, the operator will turn the machine on for you and let you charge your car. So if you ever forget your card, it happened to me once, um, it was quite handy, but I'm pretty sure if it was a free station they would do it even if it didn't have a card. And then there is level 3 charging. These are called the DC fast chargers. Um, these are 440 volts. They will charge your car in like 30 minutes. Very, very handy, like a highway rest stops. When I bought my car, there were zero in Vermont. Today, there are nine um, and more all the time. There are in, within a day or two, there will be one in Rutland. Um, the number of stations is rising dramatically. So this is the uh, early style plugging in for level three. The new ones are actually a little simpler than that. Uh, lots and lots of level three chargers in, on the west coast. You can actually drive your car up and down the west coast and just go from charger to charger. 
not quite so many on the East Coast, but this slide is a year old, um, and I, I should have updated it, but you're getting close to being able to do that here. If you factor in all the level two chargers, again, this was a year ago, I bet that's at least double today. Um, just last week, GNP and Rutland opened 16 new chargers. 16, all in a row at their operations facility on Post Road. Um, so the number of chargers is going up dramatically. When we bought, when I bought my car two years ago, there were maybe two stations in Burlington, um, and now there's 28. So the, the number of public stations is going up dramatically. Um, and one thing most people don't realize is that once you own the car, you will probably use public chargers less than you think you would have. Uh, but lots of people won't get into an electric car until they have the public station. But once they get the car, they realize they don't actually need it that much. Um, if you charge at home, every morning you come out and your car is full. Uh, and so you drive all day long um, and you don't really need the public charger. But they're there when you need them. Um, so we'll have to go relatively quickly. Um, there are rebates for buying these things. If you buy a Tesla, I'm told they bring it right to your house. Um, uh, if, uh, other cars you have to go get it, but there's a variety of rebates and incentives. There's a federal $7,500 rebate or, or tax credit for any of these cars. If you lease, the leasing company gets the rebate and they lower the cost of the lease. That's why you can lease a Nissan Leaf for $199 a month, it's partly because of this tax credit. Um, the government is trying to incentivize this field uh, because they see it as a way forward in terms of climate change and future energy policy. Um, different states have tax state rebates. Um, I don't think Vermont has one. I think New Hampshire might, and other states like Georgia and California have one. So that varies state to state. Um, and you can look into that. So do you want a car with a gas engine still or all batteries? Um, I don't know if there's a simple answer to that question. It depends on how far you drive every day. Um, if all you drive is a short distance to work and back, an all-battery car might, might be the way to go. Um, if you have two cars in your family, to me, this is my personal opinion, if you have two cars in your family, it's like a no-brainer to have one of them be an electric vehicle. Um, uh, you still have the other car to go to California um, or Ontario, uh, but then you'll, I think you'll see that on a day-to-day -day basis you'll use the electric car uh, because they're fun to drive and they're dramatically cheaper uh, to operate um, and maintain than the gas car. So, um, some people are absolutely terrified of running out of battery juice. Um, I've always been able to say we've never run out of power, but that's not true because my wife ran out two days ago. Um, she was literally 200 feet from the charger. Um, and then all her coworkers drove by and she's in her work clothes. She was quite embarrassed and a little upset with me, although it was her fault, but <laughs> I didn't say anything. She wasn't in the mood. Um, but by and large, I've had no trouble with this. The, these cars give you lots of warning when you're running low. Um, and it's kind of neat. If you're ever in a bind, and anyone who drives one of these cars has kind of been on the edge from time to time, all you have to do is drive slower. Um, at low speeds, they get far better efficiency, so if you're really stretching it, you just slow down to 30 miles an hour and irritate the people behind you, uh, but then you'll make it. Uh, so uh, it's actually kind of fun. I, I, I've enjoyed all of my time with my car. Um, and there, again, there's more and more public charging stations. Today was the longest I've ever driven my car on a single trip. So I came down from north of Middlebury um, uh, earlier today. So 120 miles from my house to here. So I charged it in Rutland, had some good food, um, and came the rest of the way. So when the weather is nice, like today, um, I was averaging 110 miles per charge in the car today, um, which is it's pretty cool. You can go a good long way with that. Um, so I charged in Rutland. I showed up and I had 30 miles left, 35 miles left even when I got here. And I'm using Brattleboro's new public chargers. Thank you, Brattleboro. Um, when I first said I would come do this thing, there was not one here, and I wasn't sure I was going to do it. It seemed uh, to be a little ironic to rent a gas car to come promote EVs. So I'm happy to say I was able to come in my knees on here today. Um, so are these things actually good for the planet? You hear a lot of people say that they're not. It's not. It's a complicated argument, but the short version is that's not true. Um, they mix up a lot of things when they make this argument. Yes, of course, it is still better for the planet to ride a bicycle or to walk. Um, of course, you're using energy to drive an electric vehicle. Um, of course, that energy has to come from somewhere, and even solar panels have to be manufactured. But I think they're mixing up an argument here. We live in a society where you have to drive. Uh, 
we live in a, a society that's organized around automotive transportation. Um, and when, if you consider that you have to drive a car, an EV is a, a choice that's dramatically better for the environment. Um, how much better depends on where you get your electricity from. So I had to go slightly quicker here, but different utility companies in different parts of the United States get their electricity from the different generation sources. And it can vary. So here, the highest emissions, which is somewhere over in the Rocky Mountains, probably 100% coal, uh, is more than three times the carbon intensity of some of us. Um, so if you wonder where we are, this is us right here, NPCC New England. So this is us. And so depending on where you live and how your power company makes the power, so the argument is EVs still pollute, the, the tailpipe is just far away. Um, sort of true, uh, but the pollution is less, and it depends on how your power company makes their power. Um, the best region, if you were to just fill up from the grid, the equivalent in New York is like 150 miles per gallon. Um, and, but even the worst, someplace like this with, okay, oh, it's almost all coal there, um, would be the gasoline equivalent of 34 miles per gallon, which isn't too bad. One thing that's left out of these statistics is that a huge number of people that drive these create their own electricity. Um, and if you create even part of your own electricity, then you can easily double or triple these numbers. Or, like I'll soon be able to do, use all solar to power my cars um, and have almost virtually no carbon emissions. Um, so, so, it's a complicated argument, but the bottom line is still that EVs are vastly more efficient than an internal combustion car. Again, uh, you're coming down a mountain with a regular car, you put on the brakes, you're just turning all of that energy into heat and it's wasted. Um, you're sitting at a stoplight, you're sitting stuck in traffic, and you look around and you realize that there's a thousand cars around you, burning fossil fuel, doing nothing. They're stuck. Um, but you're in your EV and you're not. Uh, and then you have to breathe their exhaust and you start wishing they were driving one too. Um, so... <coughs> The big remaining question, and here's another argument, and a lot of times I have to frankly say this argument is written by people that don't know about cars. Um, they say, well, it's true that EVs are better, but they're so much more expensive to produce that you have to take into lifetime uh, account of the, the products that are in the EV. Um, and what I've heard more often is they, they use dramatically more aluminum. Um, it's just not true. Whoever said that has clearly never worked on cars. Modern cars are made incredible amount of their parts, cylinder heads, transmission cases, um, are made out, even the engine blocks in some cases are made out of aluminum. I don't think there's a substantial difference there. There's probably more copper uh, by a few pounds in an electric car. Um, and then there's the argument about lithium. Um, I have a good friend who tells me regularly, yes, but people die making the lithium batteries. Um, and I didn't want to be wrong when I presented about these things, so I researched it for several weeks um, to realize that that's not really true either. Lithium is not as rare as people think it is. Um, it's largely processed from high desert places like Bolivia and Chile, uh, usually by industrial nations who provide a fair amount of, of money in return to those poor countries. So it's not like they're cutting down the rainforest somewhere to get lithium. And there's a fair amount of it. Um, lithium can be 100% recycled. It is not currently recycled because it's not expensive enough in economic supply. Uh, they do recycle some of these batteries. They take out the lead and the cadmium, not the lead, the cadmium and the nickel. In the future, it is almost certain that they will take out the lithium as well um, as we build more and more of these cars. So you end up, you end up with a vehicle that is 100% recyclable. So say it costs 30% more to the environment to manufacture the vehicle, but it is 100% recyclable as most cars are. Um, if you carry this out over, you know, theoretically a thousand generations, you could use the same material. The initial, the initial cost of producing the car is negligible. I just don't, having looked at this, hopefully with an open mind, I just don't see any merit to the argument that EVs are not good for the planet. I think EVs are clearly good for the planet, and we would all be much, much better off if we were using them and powering them with renewable energy. So, to me, the, the magic trio for living sustainably on the planet um, is to have to somehow quit this um, uh, exponential growth that we see with our market system, which, which is wonderful. But, um, we can't grow forever on a finite planet. Uh, we need renewable energy to power our things, to, to help solve our climate crisis. And we need circular systems. We need to recycle everything. Um, and I really think that electronic vehicles are a big part of that. So I only have like one minute left probably. So, uh, uh, good
Big inroads into racing. The outright winner of the Pikes Peak Hill Climb was an electric motorcycle last year. That was pretty cool. Um, number two, number two in the cars in the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Number one in the motorcycles. Uh, we're getting more charging stations, newer types of charging, better batteries, lower prices due to economy of scale. Um, and EVs is kind of a whole other presentation that have huge potential to help power companies manage their systems via smart grids. So as power companies switch over to renewable systems, um, everyone driving EVs and being plugged into that grid uh, is going to be a huge, a huge chunk of that. So that's my spiel. So I like my car. I like it a lot. I like the cars. Uh, if you haven't driven one, driven one, I encourage you to go test drive one. Um, they're not that expensive. They're good for the planet. They're nice and fun. I think you would like your car as much as I like mine if you had one. Alright. Our next speaker is Dave Cohen. And Dave is a psychotherapist. He's a psychologist in Brown Room. Dave founded Pedal Express in Berkeley, California, a nationally recognized human power delivery service that transports van sized loads utilizing a fleet of specially designed cargo bikes. Since then, he has led presentations and workshops in the US, Canada, and Europe on the subjects of transportation, environmental ethics, and eco psychology. So, bicycles come a long way. I don't know if anybody's ever been a hobby for it. Uh, this is like your early version of, uh, of a bicycle. They're also called bone shakers. Uh, so this is kind of the beginning of the bicycle. Now we're just going to take a kind of fanciful trip through a little bicycle history because like, by the 1870s and 1880s, the uh, uh, human power technology just started taking off. It was crazy, uh, some of the things that um, started happening. And of course, the high wheeler is a pretty far thing for quite a number of years, for about perhaps about 20 years, really was <clears throat> the main bicycle. There were, uh, this is actually a Boston club. There was a really great Brattleboro uh, club. Uh, people were known to ride 100 miles on these things and um, average at least three headers a day. I think it was <laughs> right off. No helmets. Uh, eventually, things started settling down a little bit. The front wheelers started, the front wheels started getting smaller. And eventually, they developed the bike into what we call the safety bike, the triangle frame, where the two triangles were together. But um, what, what's really interesting is also that the bike started being applied to uh, cargo. Uh, and this is actually the British uh, Postal Service um, uh, um, experimenting with um, pentacycles. Um, apparently, it didn't actually work so well because if you got stuck in a rut in the road, the drive wheel would. Wouldn't work yet to like jump off this thing. Um, but uh, cargo bikes, you know, throughout Europe became, became absolutely huge uh, during the uh, 1930s and 1940s. This is the, the uh, Porter race. Uh, Porters in uh, France had races every uh, year, uh, sometimes several races. Cargo bikes applied to cities, uh, city streets, and town streets uh, throughout the world, uh, delivering milk. Uh, Telephone company in um, in Holland, uh, the Tandem. And if you think that that's kind of big, you know, check this thing out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, eventually, the diamond frame uh, bicycle, the safety bicycle, was, was developed. It became the kind of the most uh, the go-to option. Um, and if you thought trailers were a new idea, this is like uh, around uh, 1912 or so. Uh, you know, trailer idea, and clearly, or where you're being used, nice wicker uh, uh, seating for the kids, and no helmets. Uh, but something happened uh, in the U.S., of course, you know, the, the automobile became the way to get around. There was a love affair with the car. The automobile, I mean, think of the word, it means, you know, automatic mobility. We're not involved at all. It means we're becoming less involved with the world in some ways. Um, but the bicycle uh, became relegated mainly for, um, for kids. Uh, so by the time the 1970s you know, rolled around, 1980s, you start getting these super lightweight bikes. And then bikes then again become very, very popular uh, with adults, 
Um, and then mountain bikes, you know, for going downhill. Um, the question is, is really, you know, what is a bike? You know, we've got all these you know, amazing lightweight uh, recreational bikes that can do all kinds of amazing things. But there was something that was left out of the picture in this country that was certainly going on in, in Europe. And that's really the bicycle as a functional vehicle. Uh, thankfully, that's coming back uh, in the United States. Um, there's all kinds of bike share programs throughout the United States. You're hearing about them every day. A new one starting up in Seattle, uh, but we've got in Chicago, uh, in DC, the capital bike share. Uh, just making biking uh, more practical uh, and more relevant to the cityscapes and the streetscapes. <laughs> Chicago, Boston, and of course New York. Um, now, you know, this is not all the pizza shops in New York, though, because <laughs> those are all the bike share stations, right? So, so this is really, um, obviously there's a shift happening from uh, car transportation towards really thinking about more kind of livable uh, ways of uh, mobility. My, one of my big interests, is, you know, as Paul mentioned, that I started a cargo delivery service in Berkeley, California. We were originally called TEDx, but then we got a letter from FedEx. <laughs> they didn't like that so much. So uh, they, they thought we were competing with them unfairly. Uh, <laughs> we still have that letter. Uh, Pell Express, which is now called Pell Express, is still going today, uh, 20th anniversary. Uh, they started that back in the mid 90s. Um, but cargo bikes have been a fascination for you know, me for a long, long time. And so there's utility bikes, cycle trucks, long tails, uh, long johns. I also have a long john. That's how I started uh, my business. With, uh, I also have one here in Brownsboro. Uh, the box feet. Sometimes uh, the long john is also called the box feet. Uh, so these are the more popular kind of designs that are out there, but really what's happening in the U.S. is something called the, the long tail bike, which you just saw. Um, there have been all kinds of news reports about the long tail. It's essentially an American design, um, uh, uh, fellow by the name of Ross Evans, who founded Extra Cycle, uh, started this idea of just, what if we stretched out the bike, you know, just, you know, so it looks like a regular bike, the first part, the front half, the next half we just stretch it out. And uh, so indeed, he, what he did is he just created a frame that can attach onto any uh, mountain bike or a road bike. And once you attach that on, you lengthen your bike, you can have seats on it, carry the cargo. Um, and uh, my friend Josh Traeger brought his bike here that also had an electric assist on it. So you have a, one of these free radical extra cycle attachments on his frame. Actually, that's his bike. <laughs> So uh, now Extra Cycles come out with a new model, uh, their uh, Edge Runner. So it's, these are fully integrated long tail bikes. You can see there's just extra capacity in the back. I attach a trailer to mine. I have the uh, Yuba Mundo, which is on top. So Yuba and Extra Cycle. There's another company called Natson that makes a really nice version of this. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is that moms, moms really take to uh, uh, cargo bikes, uh, and this is really taken off. Seattle, Portland, Vancouver. Uh, this is a more of a Long John style bike, but the others are all uh, Long John one design or another. Oh, here's a Madison right here. I didn't realize that was that one. This is nice. Got a little, you nice know, fellas. You know the bucket bike. They also have, to have a little tarp that goes over if it's raining. Really cute to see kids go around in a nice front rack. A um, bunch of moms on extra cycles. This one has an electric assist of bionics. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Dads, dads, uh, well, I'm a dad, you know. Uh, so, you know, you just watch them, you know, riding around with two, three kids on the back over here, <coughs> three children on the back. The front basket is really handy because once you have three kids, not much room for anything else. So, uh, it's nice to have that. Pregnant moms. Pregnant moms, and this way, here's a Madsen again. Uh, pregnant moms on their cargo bikes, it's just like, yeah, I love that. I just love it. Um, and then, as far as weather, um, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities. Uh, I have studded tires that I put on my bike during winter. Actually, that's me, my son, up at Hilltop School, which is a nice uh, mile and a half climb up there. Uh, but there's all kinds of other possibilities, like on this Long John style bike, uh, rain coverings. 
In the 1970s, some very smart, organized Dutch people decided the cost of a car-centric culture was too high. They fought for the return of the Rockies and livable cities. The rest of the world just kept dropping. Until recently. In most hands, it starts as it did in mine, with a mom on an extra cycle. She smiles a lot and answers lots of questions. Some people think she's crazy, and some call her supermodel. Soon, she's got a friend on the neighbor whose husband keeps giving her life. Yes, the neighbor's working on the farm, and the bike rack is full of long tails. Suddenly, there's a lady having six kids on the night. And the pizza is going to be at Eva. You spot your first real live box. Take your first test ride and discover the magic of a natural assist. The terms car free and car light are coined to describe a lifestyle that apparently makes people so intensely happy they just have to blog about it and share and chat and post and tweet until this lifestyle starts to become a part of the global culture. talk a little bit about the, the electric bikes and cargo bikes that are out there, but also a little bit of counterpoint, really considering like how, you know, so electric cars, electric bikes are all cool, technology is cool, but at what point do we actually become mindful of how our technology interfaces with us as human beings? And we'll discuss that in a minute. Um, so I just saw from Liz Cannon's film, uh, Less of a Car, More Go, it's, that's just a, a Kickstarter film. She's uh, working on the film, and hopefully it'll be done in about a year or so. Uh, it's about this excitement that's happening around bicycles, and bicycles that can do more, and bicycles that actually redefine what a bicycle is. And this is uh, actually just a shot here in Brattleboro. A bunch of people that are now buying, um, uh, bought their uh, cargo bikes, taking their families around right down the block from me. And, and so, you know, especially the electric assist. So she, she mentioned the whole thing about the electric assist <coughs> option. So you got cargo bikes, you got electric, you know, just regular electric assist, regular bikes, but it's about extending the range, the hill climbing ease, the carrying capacity, and comfort, overall uh, relevance and utility of bikes. Um, particularly in hilly areas like ours, the electric assist is really, really handy and absolutely uh, somewhat necessary, I think, for a lot, for, for a large number of people that take this up. For seniors, so uh, the local bike shop just started carrying something Hilltopper, just a little kit, snap it onto your bike, all of a sudden you've turned your bike into an electric assist bike. A lot of people that are a little bit older or have uh, physical issues are now biking around Broadway. They've never done that before. So, um, just got cut off a little bit, but um, so this just gives you an idea of just uh, some of the kinds of setups you'll find on um, electric bikes. This one has a front hub motor. You can see the battery over here, and there's a little something back here, a little black box. All electric bikes have some uh, black box or another. It's the controller. 
Uh, it was essentially the brains of the bike. Uh, a lot of these bikes have cruise control where they have uh, pedal assist options, torque sensors so that uh, the bike will just aid you um, depending on how much aid you want. And sometimes you have different levels of assist. Some of them, a lot of them have throttles, uh, like this Prodeco bike has a throttle. And this is a rear hub motor. Uh, the differences between front hub and rear um, you know, depends on what you like, uh, what the terrain is that you're traveling. Uh, that's something I can talk to you more about um, uh, after this presentation. There's mid-drive, which is a highly efficient form of uh, uh, electric assist, where the um, drive is happening right off the chain wheel, right off the chain drive of the bike. And then there are also uh, folding uh, bikes now uh, that are coming with electric assist options. Uh, you can also get um, electric assist kits. You can buy something like the Bionics, which is a really nice integrated assist, uh, system that includes um, um, regenerative braking, just like on um, the Prius and lots of other electric uh, vehicles. Um, this is the Hilltopper. This is a, one of the most simple systems you can get. And again, this is offered over at Burroughs. Uh, it doesn't even have a throttle, just a little button that you hit. 250 watt motor, and you can get up almost any hill in town. Uh, the one that I have on my bike is the EZ, and it's a similar kind of motor. Uh, it's a geared motor hub, whereas the Bionics doesn't have any gears. It's kind of like uh, it's what we call a direct drive motor. The geared motor hubs have a lot more uh, torque, a lot more power to bring you up hills. Uh, and I have a little sample of that gear here if anybody wants to look at that after this live show. So the uh, EZ is a lot more powerful than something like the um, uh, the Hilltopper uh, can really power a cargo bike up a hill. And you can also add on a, a, a mid-drive, too. There's a whole bunch of mid-drive motors that are coming on the market as well. So this, these are things you just snap onto your bike, add on to a cargo bike or whatever. Um, the uh, capability of a bike with, um, uh, especially a cargo bike with electric assist, is really phenomenal. So I've taken my kid camping. Uh, we go up to school, I can bring his bike up there, or we can ride his bike partway, uh, and the bike can actually um, be towed by um, uh, on the cargo bike. Here I went shopping, I had to pick my wife up a file cabinet, and she's looking on my list, do you really need to bring a file cabinet around? Uh, it was a fun little trip. And then uh, I even ride my wife and my kid, we, you know, we go all around the town. I really think this is the ultimate hybrid, because you're talking about human power and electric power. We're talking about really integrating our bodies back into our transportation. Um, and so the, the upper end of the sphere over here, you guys have seen uh, Peter Talmadge's Elf, uh, enough capacity back here to carry 350 pounds of cargo. You've got the solar panel on top. Uh, you, again, utilizing our bodies. The reason I'm asking is what is the I think that that's really important. Uh, comparing even like a heavy cargo bike to an automobile in terms of resource consumption, of course it's a no-brainer, and, and as far as energy consumption, it's a no-brainer. Of course, a, a, a car has a great deal more versatility as far as you know, carrying cargo and lots of kids around. Um, but as far as uh, quality of life issues in our bodies, let's, let's take a look at that, because that's really my key thing. I, I don't really talk that much about like uh, the carbon issue. Talk more about like us our, and how we uh, relate to the world around us. How do we feel about this world when we're traveling 70 miles an hour versus a much slower pace? And I realize that cars are really useful and totally you know, important, and the switch over to, to electric cars is really important. But I think it's important to consider this. So yeah, the invasion of the body snatcher. If we look at the automobile and we look at what, um, how our children, how we are confined within a sensory kind of um, deprivation tank. Uh, that's the only way I can describe, describe the car. How it's actually taking away the use of our body in 
so many different ways. And, they, and our children, you, know, you watch this in our communities where they can't move around freely because there are these fast moving things that are literally snatching away our ability to use our, our bodies and because we've planned our communities in, in this way. So, you know, really, when you look at an automobile, uh, there's a person standing there. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I don't know if you've ever experienced this at all. Yeah, yeah. So, there is a sensory deficit phenomenon in an, within the confines of an automobile. So, number one, your kind of contact with the external world, whether it's the ecological or social world, say you're passing through, uh, or uh, the external world in terms of other traffic, you're actually cut off from those sensory experiences. So, in the case of the ecological and social world, yeah, you get some experience. You're kind of looking out the window, but your sensory kind of awareness, your sensory attunement, your sensorium is largely restricted. But you're also restricted from the violence of other traffic and, and the violence that we've created in on our, on our streetscapes. Uh, so that way, the car actually protects us from not knowing what it feels like to be outside the car. So some of us got cut off because uh, I'm not sure uh, the way that the projector is showing it. But so the other thing, the other part of the sensory deficit thing is that you're actually cut off from your impact on the world because you don't know. How can you know? The architecture of the automobile is designed such that it protects us from knowing our full, the full range of impacts we're having on the world. Uh, whether it's on, on the individual that we're splashing or the greater uh, social and ecological realms that we pass through. And we're not attuned to how they're feeling about that. Or the nervous system, whoa, what happened? Right there. there you go. Uh, or the nervous system of this individual who is experiencing that. Uh, and so here's something in psychology, we have something called body dysmorphic identity disorder. That means that we don't really understand the nature of our body, the size of it. Uh, we think we're really small when we're really big, we think we're really big when we're really small. Uh, there are many ways to describe our relationship to the world and to our communities when we're driving. That's one. Some people think of it, you know, some form are also eco-autistic. There's not that kind of range of... Uh, sensory awareness to the world around us. So these things are not going to be cured by electric cars. I mean, there are other things that are really positive that, that uh, Jabari was talking about. Um, but there are certain things, like what I'm talking about here, where it's, we're talking outside of boundaries of uh, you know, carbon pollution. We're talking about how our technologies, how they uh, are so immensely difficult to put into perspective. This is a great quote from uh, Bruce Wilshire. He said, our technologies are immensely difficult to put into perspective because they insinuate themselves into our perspective and then control them. And he also said, whenever a technology becomes routine, it tends to be regarded as normal, no matter how great the disruption to the balance of things. So you know, as we uh, you know, take our children you know, on our car rides, we don't realize that we're actually kind of, you know, they're getting merged with this idea of, of the automobile. So are we, we're kind of like, in some ways, our minds have merged with the viewpoint of the automobile and the speed and the power. Um, and it's really hard to even imagine that. And that's why I love this Mark Twain uh, quote, you can't trust your eyes if your imagination is out of focus. This is actually an ad in Ford in Canada. They were advertising the car. It's just showing you how you know the human body can take the shape. But I think we're actually taking the shape in some ways. That the that the technology is actually being merged into us and our viewpoint and our worldview. And so this is what happened. And we know the physical. Uh, you know, between uh, 1960 and 2002, uh, Americans gained 25 pounds. And as far as gasoline, that, that cost $1 billion of gasoline. Just to move that extra 25 pounds around. That's enough to fill 1.7 uh, million cars for an entire year. Yeah. And then as far as sprawl, I mean, so the danger I see with you know, electric cars, I believe me, there are a lot of dangers with electric bikes, too. And I, I can talk about that later. But uh, it's, it's a sprawl issue. We're going to still be planning as if we solved the, the car problem. And this is like, uh, this is a Montpelier area showing the commercial centers, how, how we spread out. 
And the next step, of course, is the what we call car buys. Cars that will just drive themselves. And uh, I don't have time to go into that as an issue, but we can, if you want to talk about that, I'd be glad to. Uh, lastly, I just have this you know, quote from, um, uh, from Marshall McLuhan. Once we have surrendered our senses and nervous systems to the private manipulation of those who would try to benefit from putting the least on our eyes, ears, and nerves, we don't really have any rights left. And so Marshall McLuhan, who wrote, uh, talked about the medium as a message, really was into like how does technology influence our worldview? When we mediate our world, uh, our sensory experience of the world, it's going to shift our uh, our perception of the world around us and of our own humanity. So, um, so I, I'm pretty convinced that a large part of our population we're becoming cardboard. Uh, we're flattening our experience of the world. We're becoming detached, disengaged, dispassionate, and dissociated. It doesn't happen for everybody, but I think this is happening for the large uh, majority of, uh, of our population. And I really feel like we're so much more than this. And that's why I really believe in uh, biking and, walk of course, I'm a walker, too. But uh, so one of the things that um, I'm working on is I've got a contract with Go Vermont to become kind of like, the, they're calling me the bike guru. But um, what I'm doing is I'm uh, working to promote uh, cargo bikes and electric push bikes throughout the state. Um, I've got Coastal Health Solutions involved. They're, our, they're my uh, coastal sponsors for this. And um, we also got uh, the Vermont uh, State Employees Credit Union to start to uh, provide uh, green loans to people who want to buy cargo bikes starting in 2015. Uh, this is a website that's just going up now. Um, you can find it uh, on the Go Vermont website. Go Vermont is our alternative transportation agency. Uh, the great thing I really like about the whole bike thing, electric assist uh, bikes, is we don't have to ask anyone to do this. We don't have to plead with the, the government. Um, we can just start really changing what we're doing, kind of like what people are doing with electric cars, too. Uh, every time you ride, you're a positive force. You're open to the social and ecological world you encounter. Uh, and that's kind of synergetic with like everything that we really want. You know, healthy connections to our bodies, promoting local uh, communities and economies, uh, friendly communities, you know, better planet. You know, more cars really just drive more car planet. Uh, breaking away from the 1950s inspired lifestyles, uh, being attuned to the world and aware of our impact. Of course, we're going to be reducing our carbon emissions. And you can people can support this whether you're a car driver or not. You just want your community. To sound better, to feel better, and to smell better. Uh, so we have time maybe for this last video, and then um, this is the last part of uh, Liz Canning's video. Uh, Less car, more go. Let's just take a look. There is so much more to this story than another bicycle industry trend or effort to reduce emissions. To me, the coolest part of the car to bike boom is in the way these bikes reconnect us to our bodies, to our families, to our communities, and our environment. insert something else. Uh, for us to really kind of put forward our sense of being human beings who are in touch with this world. And we know that the world is in trouble. There's, you know, of course, climate change, it's all this carbon pollution and all that. But there's also the sensory experience of being in this world and really bonding and attaching with that. And I do a whole like series of uh, slides about 
the neuropsychology of that, and where are in our brain centers that happens. I didn't have time to do that. Um, but I just think adding in more you know, pedestrian travel, adding in more cargo bikes, is just going to make our lives so much more beautiful. And it's about being attuned to our sensory world. It's about being aware of our impact, knowing our impact, engaging our bodies, uh, and being mindful of the tools that we use. And sh that means really, for me, it means how we show up in this world. And uh, that's it. For electric cars, and it may be true for batteries and bikes also, with the, what, where do you think the prices are going with new battery technology coming in? Yeah, so battery prices have gone from, for cars, just recently, from $800 to $1,000 per kilowatt down to uh, the latest Nissan price is about $250 per kilowatt. Uh, they say they say the two hundred dollar, two hundred fifty dollar price point would be the point at which uh, there's a true fundamental shift in the pricing of the cars. Um, so Tesla has just opened up and they're currently building this Giga factory. Um, and Elon Musk is predicting prices below two hundred um, per kilowatt when they get this. So uh, there's uh, just like solar panels have dropped precipitously over the years, um, battery prices and battery capability has gone up at the same time. So. So is that going to make the price of electric vehicles drop significantly it should, in the next should. two years? I, I, I think it will be a continuing drop. I, I find people that disagree. I mean, I, I don't read articles that agree with me, but from what I've read, I see car electric cars approaching cost parity with uh, gas cars within five years, mm -hmm. uh, where it's just going to be outright cheaper to buy an electric car. They're just, they're just easy. They're just simpler. Um, there's, there's no way that can't happen, um, particularly with battery prices. Now. How often do you have to change out the batteries? So we don't know, is the short answer to that. Uh, initial initial results from car batteries have, they are all exceeding the timeline that they thought they would. Um, this is the same that's true for Toyota Priuses, even the original batteries. Are and what's that like? Yeah, years, yeah seven so years. they don't really know. My advice, people ask me, should I buy or should I lease? My advice, my, advice, my personal feeling is, I'm going to keep leasing until they figure these things out. Um, so I'm leasing my car for two years. It's going to be perfectly fine for two years, and then I'll let, let the manufacturer do it. Um, when they do ship them out, Nissan's new battery pack is like $5,000. Um, and then there's going to be labor to put that in. But right now, they seem to be, and it depends on how you use them, how fast you charge them. Um, but they're starting to say 15 to 20 years. Um, so it's not, it's not a, a huge work. How about um, heat, heat in the LEAF in the winter? Yeah, so the LEAF, I don't know about the other manufacturers, the LEAF actually, the new LEAF actually has a heat pump. And this heat pump technology is quite efficient. It does make a difference though. In the winter, the range is substantially lower. So I was talking about getting 100 miles a day, over 100 miles a day. If this was a negative 15 degree below day, I would be lucky to get 60 miles. Um, so that's 15 below. Uh, and it varies from there, you know. 25 degrees, the, the range might be 20% or 30% more. Um, so, uh, and it's a double whammy in the winter, the battery holds less power, and then you're using the heat, um, you're using the defrost, um, and that's part of that range reduction. Same thing with uh, you know, electric bikes. I, sometimes I'll sleep with my battery. <laughs> no, I, I put it right here in the stove, and I keep it warm, and then, you know, then I can just you know, come out with them and slap them. Um, my husband's uh, entire shop is uh, grid time. He produces, well, 96% of the power for um, Tampa Bay King's shop. And we were looking at the idea of getting an electric vehicle as a uh, commuter vehicle, um, but don't want to plug in, don't want to plug it into the nuke, basically. <laughs> so we're wondering how many more panels. Quite a bit. So that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm adding 10,000 watts of solar right now to my barn. Um, and that should power both our cars. Uh, it never depends on what kind of car you had and how often you drove them. So um, but, one. But so for, for comparison's sake, my off-grid house, I use about five kilowatts a day. My car, I use 20. 
Um, you go 100 miles. So between the two, you go about 20. So my electric car uses what four times the power that my off-grid house does. So it's a substantial amount of power. And if you're going to put up solar panels, you're going to need substantially more if if you want to break even in that capitalism. Um, and that's where I would throw in that you know uh, when you're talking about electric bike or even something like the Elf, you're moving far less in terms of weight. Uh, and you're also contributing, you know, energy to it. So the uh, as far as powering up the solar panels, uh, electric bike is a very small, you know, uh, capacity. And, and then there's mid grades. There's electric motorcycles now. Yeah. The, the electric motorcycles are getting rave reviews. There's a company called Zero. Um, it's turning die-hard motorcycle fans into electric motorcycle fans. Um, Harley Davidson just made their new their new their new model is electric. It's called the Livewire. Um, it's getting very good as well. Yeah, um, for electric bikes, one was in uh, Florida when they had the RV uh, solar panels for RVs that were bikes. Yeah. So you can all be off the grid with just that little battery charger that's solar. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you don't even need to send it in. Right. I just want to make a comment about this human sensory perception of things. Um, my electric car has gauges on it that shows what percent of the, of the drive train I'm actually utilizing when I climb a mountain or go down a hill. And it, it's actually, because of that, the instrumentation feedback, it's actually brought me into closer contact mm. With what I'm actually doing, right? right. Where, where my gas car, you know, I plow up the hill, and you know, you have the disconnect or no perception of, of how much power you're consuming. Is it that more yeah. 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 Where with my electric car, I'm starting to get a, an internal sense of, of how much it takes, you know, or the cause and effect of, of gradually. Increasing acceleration or gradually slowing down and climbing. <coughs> and like that. Related that your cars are so quiet, I can literally hear birds chirping when I'm going down the highway, which you would never hear in a gas car. Um, so maybe I, I really like Dave's presentation. But, but but suddenly from my electric car, I'm now consciously <coughs> in tune with what I'm actually doing in terms of energy. Right, right. It's, it's, it's changed yeah. how I drive my gas car. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, um, the, the uh, panels to charge your car. What was the um, investment required for, for something to be sustainable? You know, like per yeah, car? so that's called grid parity. And that's another complicated question. <laughs> um, cost of solar panels is yeah, coming down. It depends a lot on how you mount them. It depends a lot on where you live. It depends a lot on future interest rates, um, the price of your current grid power. How much labor you can do yourself, the current rebates. Um, I wrote a blog post about it like two weeks ago. So <laughs> it is complicated. The bottom line is that uh, solar has reached grid parity in parts of the United States right now um, Arizona, um, Southern California, Hawaii. It's very close in other places. And if you can do a lot of your own labor, uh, you can. it pays off right now. Grid parity means? Grid parity would mean that your total outlay for your solar is less or equal than the total outlay you would pay to the grid for the same amount of power over the lifetime of solar panels. So 30-year investment here, 30-year investment here, you come out ahead of the solar or even. Um, and we're very, very close to that. But again, it's, it's a very complicated calculation. Some of it depends on future trends, and in, in some cases it's just a guess anyway. Uh, but, but we're getting close. Uh, solar's getting quite a bit cheaper. Um, and for all you out there, the, the big federal rebate expires at the end of next year. So uh, not sure what they're going to do with it after that. They might extend it, but I doubt they extend it like they did right now. So right now, 30% <coughs> rebate on solar through next year. Um, through 2016. Through 2016. Oh, through 2016? Okay. Okay, so we got a little more time. Yeah. It's going to eventually cut the year. Doing it in part because solar, the price of solar is dropping. Solar, solar is going to be able to compete on its own um, quite soon. Um, so I know some people probably want to go, um, so don't feel like you're weird if you go, but I'm certainly happy to stay here. One, one last one. <laughs> bicycle question. Do you yeah, have a feeling about converting a bike to be a, a 
assisted by versus buying one that's already set up? Um, well, I think if you have a bike that you already like, uh, the choices of the market are now uh, way better than where you just a year ago. So, uh, so if you have a bike you like, I would investigate doing that. If you're going for a cargo bike, then definitely I would go for uh, a uh, uh, retro food system. Because the ones that the cargo bike companies are putting on their bikes are not really suited for at least you know, this area. So if you live around here, you can a relate to the bike, um, are, are the electric uh, powers set up to take the cuts down mean that you would might expect to, to have on, uh, you know, uh, down the, the Vermont or Washington Road or a couple of stream beds in it and so on? Yeah, yeah, they, they were remarkably, uh, not only efficient, but rugged. Uh, so mine is, I've been on dirt roads in the winter, and then, you know, it's just it's too so the, the bouncing and the the uh, instability of, of off-road is, is designed Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you get back to but the, the, the motor keeps on going. My, my bike has a front-wheel drive, so it's essentially an all-wheel drive bike. So I drive the rear wheel, I've got a front hump motor on it, so it's, uh, it's really great traction, and uh, yeah, it's totally fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, help yourself to the pack for that and be sure to visit the museum.